Hi, in this video I'm going to talk about something which is very important to a lot of astronomers, both amateur and professional. It's the impact of these large satellite constellations on astronomy. In 2019, pictures such as these became commonplace. It shows a train of satellites crossing the field of view. 60 satellites were in this train at an altitude of 300 kilometers. In time, the train disperses and the satellites move into their higher orbits. The satellites formed part of a large constellation of low Earth orbit satellites to deliver a fast internet service across the globe. In the UK, the service is currently available as a beta test. It costs £500 setup fee. This is to buy a small dish and all the associated equipment that goes with it and £90 per month. So it's relatively expensive compared to standard broadband. There are no data caps. The service advertised unlimited usage, fast latency times as low as 20 milliseconds, download speeds of 100 to 200 megabits per second and uploads of around 20 megabits per second. And obviously such figures will improve as the network grows. And this could be pretty big. It could be as big as rebuilding the entire internet in space. Okay, well, here's some numbers. Um, there are just over 2,200 satellites in orbit as of making this video. Um, 243 have failed or have been deorbited. In fact, most of the satellites launched in 29 were actually test versions, which have been deliberately deorbited. Um, when the SpaceX Starship comes along, it'll be able to launch an incredible 400 satellites in one go. And approval has been given by the ITU for 12,000 satellites. And um, incredibly, um, Starlink are seeking approval for an extra 30,000 satellites. So to put these numbers in perspective, in the 65 years since the start of the space age with the launch of Sputnik 1, 12,500 satellites have been put into orbit and roughly 8,000 of these are still in space. Um, 5,000 are still functioning. So if that number includes 2,000 Starlink satellites, 40% of the satellites functioning in orbit are Starlink satellites. That's an incredibly high number. So we're really talking about a step change here. And of course, um, SpaceX with their Starlink satellite constellation aren't the pl only player here. Other operators include Telesat, Amazon with their project Kuiper and uh, the British company OneWeb, which I'll talk about next. Well, um, Telesat are a Canadian company which has a constellation of 298 low Earth orbit satellites. So a bit smaller than Starling, quite a bit smaller, but they're looking to expand this to at least 800 satellites in the near future. Well, Project Kuiper, which is owned by Amazon, um, a little bit again behind Starlink, they have authorization to launch over 3000 satellites into low Earth orbit. Um, they haven't launched any so far, but they have the muscle of Amazon behind them who have already promised to invest over $10 billion into this project. OneWeb are a British company which went bankrupt in March 2020 at the start of the COVID pandemic. They exited bankruptcy in November of the same year and are currently partially owned by the UK government. They currently have 394 satellites in orbit. Again, they're much smaller than Starlink. And the other difference is their market is primarily to businesses and governments, which of course includes defence phone network operators and clusters of communities rather than individual domestic companies. Well, these companies are all in um, 
competition to, to some extent with each other, SpaceX recently won a judgment which enabled it to lower its altitude of its next batch of satellites from 1150 down to 550 kilometers, which is roughly the same altitude as Amazon's um, Kuiper constellation. Um, the FCC, in its judgment, decided that lowering the orbits um, didn't create significant interference problems and enabled SpaceX to do things like more quickly deorbit the dead or broken satellites to a fiery end in the Earth's atmosphere. Well, the first thing to say is because um, these satellites are all in low Earth orbit, they actually spend most of the night in the Earth's shadow um, where they're not illuminated by the sun. And they're only visible at twilight hours where they appear as fast moving dots across the sky, typically taking only five minutes to get from one side of the sky to another. There's a number of factors that affect the brightness of a satellite. First of all, obviously the area of the satellite, the bigger the satellite, the brighter it is. The shape of the satellite. Um, the re reflectivity or albedo as it's sometimes called. Um, it's the percentage of incident light from the sun which is reflected back. For example, a satellite completely covered in soot would have a reflectivity of close to zero and would be, absorb all the sunlight that hits it and be almost invisible. And an albedo of one at the other extreme means that all the sunlight that hits the satellite is reflected back. Obviously the distance from the observer, the closer to the observer, the brighter the satellite and the orientation, the angle the satellite makes between the sun and the observer. Astronomers use the magnitude scale when talking about the brightness of objects as seen from Earth. The brightest stars have a magnitude of one and the faintest stars which are just about visible to the naked eye without a telescope have a magnitude six. They are a hundred times fainter. Each step in magnitude means that an object is roughly 2.51 times fainter. The very brightest objects actually have a magnitude less than one. The brightest star, Sirius, in the sky has a magnitude of minus 1.4. The brightest planet, Venus, has a magnitude of minus 4.9. And the Sun has a magnitude of minus 26.9. Here's a link to a paper by the astronomer Anthony Malama, published in 2021, who measured the brightness of Starlink satellites. He came out with a figure of 5.92, which means that these satellites are only just about visible to the naked eye, which is what Starlink and these other companies are aiming at. Um, this is good news. It's actually 1.3 times, 1.3 magnitudes fainter than the earlier satellites which didn't have a visor attached to them. However, a couple of caveats. Um, this is a mean and for a given orientation, 5% of satellites had a maximum magnitude between plus four and plus five. So they would have been easily visible to the naked eye. And the other thing is there's a large and ever increasing number of these satellites. So even if we've only got 5% of themes, visible to the naked eye, 5% of a large number is quite a large number. Well, while I was researching for this video, I spoke to a number of fellow amateur astronomers and um, the general consensus is existing image processing software can reject bad pixels caused by satellite tracks. The number of satellite tracks appearing in images captured around the 
morning and evening twilight will obviously increase over the next decades because there's going to be more of these low Earth orbit satellites. Astronomers may have more work to do, particularly if we go by year 2040, there might be 50,000 of these in low Earth orbit, but we should be able to handle this. The LSST is a large telescope being constructed in Chile, which is expected to begin science operations in October 2023. Interestingly, it's now called the Shimoni Survey Telescope after Charles Shimoni, who donated $20 million of his own money to the project. I just love this picture. It shows the um, large 8.4 meter primary and the smally tertiary mirror just after being cast from the same piece of glass. And here's some numbers. Um, from its mountaintop site in the Andes, the LSST will take more than 800 images each night with its 3.2 billion picture, pixel camera. It's going to re record the entire visible sky twice each week. So each patch of sky images will be visited 1,000 times over the lifetime of the survey. But because of its um, large field of view and its sensitive detectors, the LSST may be particularly badly affected by the proliferation of low Earth orbit satellites, perhaps even uniquely badly affected. And here's a statement from the um, Vera Rubin Observatory to effect. This is a small extract from it. The full statement is available at the link shown below. When we have uh, two back-to-back -back exposures, one with the satellite train, one without it, then the one with the satellite train can be rejected. But this rejection, this mitigation scenario, costs the LSST up to 8% additional observing time, include, which we need to accommodate the additional readout time, shutter motion, and assumes a negligible cost due to the rejected pixels. However, um, another thing to consider is the LSST is looking for near-Earth asteroids. And a lot of these are inside the Earth's orbit. And, and this will be severely affected because these directions are only visible during twilight hours when these satellites are at the brightest. So nearly every LSST image looking at this time will be affected by a satellite trail. Now, obviously, um, LSST, Vera Rubin Observatory, are working with the satellite companies together to get a solution. Um, so efforts such as designing fainter satellites, we talked about the VisaSat, improving image processing algorithms so they are better able to filter out satellite streaks, and improving perhaps even scheduling algorithms based upon knowledge of the satellite's orbit orbital motions may provide additional mitigation strategies. But at the moment, it's fair to say it's a big concern. Obviously, because these satellites are transmitting at radio frequencies, there's going to be an impact on radio astronomy. Radio astronomy normally takes place in protected bands. For example, the 21 centimetre hydrogen line, the OH line, and a higher frequency line used for water vapour observations. And satellites can't transmit in these frequencies. So this shows the um, frequencies which Starlink have asked for, and these aren't in any protected bands. So there shouldn't be any impact providing radio astronomers observe in their protected bands. However, Radio astronomers can observe and do observe at frequencies outside the protected bands as radio telescopes are usually located in radio quiet zones. But in the future, there may not be any radio quiet zones anywhere with these satellites being in space. And there's the also the possibility of interference with observations. And maybe we'll move to a stage where it's impossible to do any radio astronomy outside the protected bands.
There's a lot that's uncertain at the moment with the um, proliferation of satellites over the next 10 years. So I'll leave the final word with Tony Beasley, who's director of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And on a final note, there is a demand for cheap and fast internet across the world, including remote areas which just don't have the fixed line infrastructure. But probably the most important thing at all, there's a lot of money to be made, as I'll show in the next slide.